Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Teacher Stories. This is your host, Ken Federnick. And the first of my two guests today is another Federnick, Jennifer Federnick, my sister-in-law who I first met in the late 1960s when she was dating my brother, Bob. Long before I ever imagined being a podcast host, long before podcast was even a word, I recall Jennifer telling stories about growing up in North Carolina and about an educator at her high school named Bruce Stewart, who played a pivotal role in her life and went on to become an extraordinary educational leader and a fierce advocate for social justice. Jennifer, welcome to Teacher Stories. Good morning, Ken. What an honor to be here. Well, our main guest today is Bruce Stewart himself, who is now retired and is living in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Bruce is not on the call yet, and he doesn't know that one of his former students from 58 years ago at Page High School in Greensboro, North Carolina, will be joining the call shortly to offer words of gratitude. First, let me say a bit about Jennifer. After marrying my brother in 1971, they have lived and worked in San Francisco where they raised their two children and now enjoy two grandchildren. Jennifer was a research librarian for over 20 years at McKinsey and Company. And during that time, she served as a secondary editor of the book In Search of Excellence, authored by her bosses, Tom Peters and Robert Waterman in 1982. Amazingly, there are now more than 6 million copies of that book in print. And she has since edited numerous other books and publications, including some of my own articles about education. In 2011, she published a wonderful memoir, a collection of poems and stories titled, I Never Expected This Good Life. Today, Jennifer, you're going to pay tribute to Bruce Stewart, your high school guidance counselor, who I suspect deserves some of the credit for the happy life you've written about. Jennifer, thanks so much for being part of Teacher Stories, and thank you for reaching out to some of Bruce's other students from nearly 60 years ago. Um, Jennifer, um, we're, Bruce is not yet on the call, so I'm going to ask you to hide your video, and then I'm going to bring Bruce in and talk with him a little bit, and then we'll ask you to come back in and, and surprise him, and then you can read your tribute to him. Okay. See you soon. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, well, hi, Bruce, and I want to welcome you to Teacher Stories, and I want to thank you for joining the Teacher Stories. Happy to do it. Thank you. Um, Bruce, you're now retired, but uh, you spent a, a, a long career as an educator, and, and you, you were a, uh, an advocate for social justice. I, I'd love for you to share some stories about that, but first, I just want our listeners to know that your last job before retiring was head of school at Sidwell Friends School in Washington, DC. Uh, some of our listeners may know that Sidwell Friends is a Quaker school, but I doubt most of our listeners and viewers know what it means to be a Quaker or what a Quaker school is all about. I wonder if you could just say a bit about, about that. Well, they're deeply committed to uh high pluralism in the student population. So you have people of both genders and all kinds of racial backgrounds and international students. It's about as an eclectic uh, student population as you could have in an independent school. And that made it an exciting and dynamic place to be in my judgment and gives a great deal of enrichment to the educational experience that students have. So you had some pretty high profile students uh at, at we did we did it said well friends can you just say a bit about some that come to mind um uh Hillary and bill clinton's daughter uh obama's two daughters biden's grandchildren and uh, a bunch of others and was a whole flock of uh, people and, that were. well i want to uh we, we may come back to your time at Sidwell Friends, but I really want to go back and, and talk with you about your, your career path and how you ended up uh, there. But um, let, let's go back and talk about when you went off to college. You were, as I recall, you're living in the Boston area. You were a Celtics fan. You played basketball yourself, and then you went off to college 
I believe Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina. I recall or I, I, I read that there was a sit-in at a local Woolworth store at the time. Yes, uh, what there was, was that protest yes. about and were you, were you there? I was there live and in color. Yeah. Because the two teachers I just mentioned to you, Mildred Mallette and Ed Burroughs, were both people who had served time in federal prison because they wouldn't volunteer to serve in the military because they were Quakers and the pacifists. And they had come to get positions at Guilford College. And they came to find me and said, uh, we, we want to get you involved in Quaker education because I was now in my junior year. I said, to do that, though, we're going to have to send you over to Page High School to be a practice teacher with some of those. And then we want you to work with some of the students there. And I went and did that and uh, it was an incredible encounter. And I had groups very soon of about 25 or 30 kids from Page High School, all of whom wanted to go on to college. And I became a kind of personal advisor to them, as well as the counselor at Page High School. Well, I gather that it was a segregated school and you were asked to coordinate an effort to integrate the school. What I was by Terry Sanford. Talk about that a little bit. How, how did that happen? And, and uh, well, they were, it, did you meet I, much resistance in, the, in your effort to do that? Oh yeah, there was a lot of resistance. Uh, fortunately, not as problematic as they thought it might be initially, but uh, there were a lot of people who uh, had kids at Page High School at the time who worked in the uh, factories in Greensboro, uh, building carpets and, and uh, stuff like that. And they were, uh, People had no interest in being in integrated schools. They didn't want their kids in integrated schools. Bruce, you know, you spent uh, such a wonderful career as an educator, and you were a teacher yourself, a guidance counselor. Um, but you also worked with a lot of teachers. I wonder if you could just say something about the qualities that you think uh, you see in some of the best teachers that you've ever worked with. What, what is it that makes a great teacher in your mind? Well, the most critical thing I think is that they have a passion for young people. And they want to see these young people grow and develop in the best possible way that they can. Secondly, I wanted people who were interested in all children because I believed in this theme. I carried this throughout my whole career in education. Liberty and justice for all was a fundamental value of the United States of America in my mind because I was a child of an immigrant from Scotland who had only a second grade education because he was bombed out of there by the Germans and so forth. And I said, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life advocating for equal opportunity and thorough exposure for all young people from whatever their background, their economic level, their racial, their religious faith. And so I said, that's what I wanna do and that's what I'm gonna work hard on. And I spent uh, my time and, and there was no better place to try to do that kind of thing than there was at a Quaker school. I, I suspect through, uh, at, after being an educator, uh, for an entire career, you've had students who have come back along the way to express uh, something to you about what it meant to have you as a guidance counselor, as a teacher. Do you recall anyone coming back and and um, and and recounting to you what it was like to have you as in their life as an educator? Well, you may know the one I'm talking about. <laughs> I would think about well, first. yes, we Jennifer Futernick, uh, who was a young lady that I was just uh, enthralled with. Um, such a brilliant mind, such a strong value system, uh, such universalist uh, concerns, and uh, she. But many others. I, I wound up then eventually having dozens and dozens and dozens of close contacts, and many of them eventually came to work for me in different schools too, as members of the faculty as I moved on through my. Well. Bruce, I have a surprise for you. Oh my goodness. I do. I, I have someone on the line. It's uh, been listening in, but it's going to join us in just a minute. And uh, it, it so happens it's a former student from Page High School in 1963, but it's a person who has spoken to other students that you had during that time. And this person's going to join us in just a second. Um, oh, goodness. And, and, uh, and, and he's going to read a tribute to you. Oh, wow. So, uh, uh, a I, positive one. <laughs> I'm excited about this, and I, I think you're going to enjoy this. So I'm going to ask our, our guest you. to join us. Hello, Bruce. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> How are you, young lady? 
thank you for calling me young lady. Uh, <laughs> I'm great. I am, uh, uh, my heart has just been going pit a pat or just seeing uh -huh. you and, um, and listening to your very remarkable story. And uh, Ken has given me the distinct honor today of, of delivering to you a tribute. And I will do that in a minute. But, but before I do that, I wanna say that it is so clear, you talked about the dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of students whom you have loved and whom you have specifically helped. And when, when I lived in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, <laughs> one of the families that I love particularly was the Bernstein family. And they had a Jewish family, I, I'm Jewish. <laughs> Uh, they had six children in a very large table and around the table, and I would love to eat dinner with them, we would all hold hands before eating. And Mr. Bernstein in his lovely Southern soft voice would, would deliver a blessing. So I want today to almost feel as if I am inviting the dozens or hundreds or thousands of students whom you have influenced and guided and helped and inspired to join around this virtual table. You're at the head of it. We're all holding hands uh -huh. and, and, and delivering you a blessing. And so it's gonna come in the form of this tribute, Bruce. Thank you so very much. A Mutual Admiration Society. In 1956, when I was seven years old, I love to sing a catchy tune, Mutual Admiration Society, recorded by the perky singer, Teresa Brewer. I recently learned that the term Mutual Admiration Society was first coined in the 1800s and linked to British literary societies. But back then, as now, that term refers simply to people who admire and flatter each other. Bruce, you and I have belonged to a mutual admiration society <laughs> for 58 years. Wow. It all started at Walter Hines Page Senior High School in Greensboro, North Carolina, fall semester of 1963, mm -hmm. when I was 14 and you were 24. Today, I am 71 and you 81. For nearly six decades, We've talked on the phone, written letters, celebrated joys and achievements together, and like all good friends, comforted, comforted each other in times of great sorrow. One particularly moving memory is when Michelle Obama called you to say she'd chosen Sidwell friends to send the Obama girls to. You hung up from her and immediately called me. There were in equal parts pride and humility in your voice as you reflected that your civil rights work had started in Greensboro at Page High School and would have a wonderful bookend when you welcomed the Obama girls to Sidwell Friends. You have given me the extraordinary compliment of saying that in over 50 years in education, I have been your favorite student. Absolutely. Well, truthfully, Bruce, in as august a career as yours, many students have held a stellar place in your heart and mind. Yes. But I will take the compliment with equal parts pride and humility. And though you were my 10th and 11th grade guidance counselor and te technically not my teacher, I want you to know that you are the teacher who's made the greatest impact on my life. You have been my favorite teacher. My life is almost inexpressibly better for having you as my friend, educational inspiration, and role model for tolerance and inclusivity. Let's go back to page high, 1963. December report cards had just come out. I flunked geometry. This might seem unremarkable because many students stumble academically in high school. 
but my story had a twist. I had always been an excellent student, even in math. In elementary school, I won academic awards. I was one of a handful of students in Newburgh, New York, selected for a regional gifted students program. I skipped the sixth grade. But after my father died and my mother remarried a man who could only be described as disturbed, if not deranged, and we moved from upstate New York to rural West Virginia and then to Morgantown, West Virginia and Greensboro, North Carolina in rapid succession, I ended up in the 10th grade technically going to three schools in one semester. The sorry situation started with my enrollment in 10th grade new math honors geometry at Page High School. And then, and now I'm gonna take a deep breath and bear with me to this convoluted story. When my mother and younger sister and I escaped in the middle of the night from my abusive stepfather and moved in with my two older brothers attending the University of West Virginia, and I enrolled the next day in regular geometry class at Morgantown High School. And then when that living situation, no surprise, didn't work out. And after six weeks, we had to move back to North Carolina and return to my stepfather. And I returned to Page High and that God awful new math honors geometry, having missed out on all coherent explanations of geometry of any kind, I was utterly lost. I got my report card and was devastated to see the F in geometry. I knew who Mr. Stewart was because he played a visibly calm and inspiring role in helping our school integrate that semester. I had heard you speak at school assemblies and often heard your wonderful, resonant, booming voice over the loudspeaker, but I didn't really know you yet. Still, I screwed up my courage. I was 14 at the time walked into your small office next to the other two guidance counselors, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Hodnett, and I asked if I could speak to you. Sure, you said warmly. I closed the door and remember sitting in the chair across from your desk and bursting into uncontrollable tears. And then trying to catch my breath and trying to catch you up on my dismal math situation and even just a few of my family problems. I remember feeling desperate. Two years earlier, my beloved Aunt Ray had committed suicide. And though I knew I did not want to kill myself, something about my life at 14 felt over. I was losing my academic grip, but of greater importance, my confidence grip. And because like my two older brothers, I would need a full scholarship to go to college. I was pretty sure my F would blow those chances. You listened quietly and then said, Jennifer, your problems are real and they are serious, but I will help you. Oh my goodness, I could breathe again. You continued. I think I can find other people to help you deal with some of the family problems at home, but you need to know that this whole geometry mess was not your fault. I will arrange for you to take geometry again and with the other students who didn't pass geometry and whatever you grade you make in that class, that will be on your transcript, not this one. So the next semester I took geometry from a great math teacher, Mrs. Joyce King and got an A and I learned to love geometry. Well, Life is simultaneous. We experience it through our own private lens, but open the aperture just even a little bit and broader historical forces are always swirling around us. Amidst the turmoil in my personal and academic life in the fall of 1963, a much larger story 
was unfold unfolding at Page High School. You were central in that story too. Back then, high school started in the 10th grade. And my first day of high school was the day our high school integrated. Of the over 500 students in rain, and sorry, of, of the over 500 students enrolled at Page, something historic happened that first week in September. Nine of the students were black. I want to name them now, all nine of them. Norris Aikens, Glency Clark, Marilee Douglas, Arlene Dunbar, Jacqueline Jeffrey, Karen Kirksey, Stephen McLaughlin, Jeanette Rankin, and Julius Rankin. Because of your Quaker commitment to social justice and your excellence at Page as a history student teacher, you were hired to shepherd the integration process. I am certain you helped each one of these nine students many times and always with your particular blend of respect, commitment, composure, earnestness, and wit. This week, I spoke to two of those African-American students, Karen Kirksey and Marilee Douglas. Here's what Karen Kirksey, now a civil rights worker in Raleigh, wanted to say to you. Bruce, but I still like to call him Mr. Stewart, was a testament to the notion that there could be normalcy for me in school again, that I could return to being seen as me and as a successful student, especially in English. Because when we transferred to Page, our grades at Lincoln High School, or sorry, or Lincoln Junior High, which was all black, had been depreciated. I therefore felt I was not placed correctly or appropriately. Day three of the first week of school, I went into Mr. Stewart's office and implored that I be put into Mrs. Betts's honors English class and was. But it was always the person, Mr. Stewart, not his position as guidance counselor that I was being helped by. He took our talent and psychological needs seriously and gave them credence. Marilee Douglas, a Presbyterian minister at, in Chapel Hill said this about you. Bruce had a sympathetic ear, always. He was never a high profile social justice mover and shaker like a Bishop William Barber or a Congressman John Lewis but he definitely had impact toward creating a more just society through the influence he had on the lives of individual students throughout his career. I was one of them. And I got testimonials from three other classmates whom I know you remember fondly. This from Susan Bernstein, who's recently retired as director of social work at Mount Sinai Hospital and lives in New York City. I want to pay tribute to the length and strength of Bruce's legacy, his long haul commitment to racial and social justice. So much of his work is now infusing a whole generation of students. The ideals that he stands for, he demonstrated to so many people in so many ways and for so many years. To describe him is simple. He knows what is right, and he is just. From Celia Snavely, our class of 66 valedictorian and a retired social worker who lives in Greensboro, these lovely words. I remember Bruce not only as our guidance counselor, but also as a revered teacher at Page. His emphasis on social justice in high school was just so notable and everyone respected him for it. Also, his love of students. That was absolutely crucial to him and we knew it. 
And finally, I called Angela Hoffler, a retired educator herself who lives in Greensboro, now Angela Hoffler Berry, as you know. She admitted that she had difficulty capturing your essence because, to quote her, it was like trying to capture a moonbeam. Nevertheless, here's what she said. Bruce is one of those people just embedded in your soul. He carries a powerful aura in his life. At our high school, he was like a rock star, tall, handsome, and inspiring, but you could also trust him. When I studied education in college, he was both my role model and a mentor to me. And he has subsequently, for my oldest and youngest daughters, been that a generation later. So yes, it's a very lucky club that many of us belong to. The Bruce Blakely Stewart Mutual Admiration Society. Please know, Bruce, especially, that our words of admiration and affirmation come to you because so many words of admiration and affirmation came from you. We salute you for the educational and social ideals you have dedicated your entire adult life to, but mostly, we love you simply for who you are, our friend. As Karen Kirksey, who, as you might know, was my college roommate, said to me the other night, Bruce's door was always open to listen to and to help you. I was so happy to have him there with us at Page. He felt like a friend. So thank you, Mr. Stewart. Now, Bruce, you have been a teacher friend to so, so many fortunate students. You have certainly been that to me. Thank you and God bless you. Jennifer, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, moving tribute. Uh, it just uh, was wonderful. Bruce, I, I want to give you a chance to just uh, to respond to Jennifer a bit. As I mentioned to you when we talked earlier, she was an extraordinary person from the first moment that I met her, and she's continued to be throughout all these years, and we've stayed very closely in touch over 50-some years now. And uh, she also was very important in helping me connecting with other students. At Page High School and throughout uh, my career in the field of education. And I've never known a better human being than that young lady. Mm. I treasure her and hold her in the highest possible esteem. Mm. And I've, uh, I think, reared my daughter and many of the other young ladies whose lives I've touched uh, in that spirit because of you and because of what you meant to me. And I thank you for that. And I'm sitting right now in my daughter's home in uh, Tennessee, Chattanooga, and I'm delighted that she invited me here to share this experience with you. And she's recording it, and I'm going to watch it again and again. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. Because I just, uh, as an educator myself, um, and now someone who has this podcast called Teacher Stories. I want to thank you for sharing your story with us today and Jennifer, of course, for sharing your tribute and, and the tributes of um, some of Bruce's other students. But I just, you know, as an educator on behalf of our the profession and, and really just being a, a citizen in this country, I want to thank you for your contributions and the courage throughout your career as an advocate for social justice. Um, it, it's clear through uh, hearing Jennifer's words what a uh, profound impact you've had on so many people, uh, countless numbers of people. And I just wanna thank you for that. Thank you so much. And I'm working right now 
and social justice. Yeah. Right now, now as important as ever. Always important. And Bruce, I just, uh, and Jennifer, I just want to say that this story, this conversation between the two of you is such a powerful reminder of how important it is for all of us to recall the people at our schools who made a difference in our lives. And often they are our teachers, but sometimes they are our gu guidance counselors. Sometimes they're our coaches, our teacher's aides, custodian, and countless others, and, and to thank them for their contribution. So I want to encourage listeners and viewers out there who uh, are watching and listening to this to, uh, to look them up. Um, track them down, give them a call, send them a note. You can also submit an appreciation on our website, teacherstories.org, and the world will see those words of appreciation. Um, as a colleague of mine said on a recent podcast episode, it's never too early to say thank you to an educator, but it, it may be too late if you wait too long. Yes, thank you once again to you, Bruce, uh, for your your great work, your commitment to teaching, to the profession, to your students, to our democracy. And Jennifer, thanks for offering your words of, of gratitude. So with that, I think I'm going to uh, uh, sign off and, and thank our listeners for listening and um, stay tuned for more episodes. Bye everyone. In June 1965, Bruce wrote these words in Jennifer's yearbook. Jennifer, warmest regards to a sweet, sincere, and sensitive young lady. I shall always value the friendship we have established. It has been a truly refreshing experience to know you. I look forward with great anticipation to the many things that I am sure will come about as the result of our friendship in the years ahead. Sincerely, Mr. Stewart.